Welcome, listeners, viewers, depending how you are witnessing this for Assiduous Dust, episode number 16. Uh, Merry Christmas, uh, Happy Hanukkah, past or Kwanzaa, or Chris Mahanza Kwanzaa. I am Joshua Corwin. I'm here to have the lovely Melissa Stuttered for uh, Assiduous Dust. Uh, episode number 16 to close us out. I'm super excited. And for those of you who don't know, here's a little something, just a little something highlighting all the grooviness that is, or who is uh, Melissa Stuttered. And we'll get more into that and find out more about her. Uh, hopefully, maybe she'll, she'll, this will inspire a tell-all. Um, <laughs> Melissa Stuttered is the, I'm looking at my cheat sheet. Shh. Melissa Stuttered is the author of the poetry collection, I Ate the Cosmos for Breakfast, yum, and the poetry chapbook, Like a Bird with a Thousand Wings. Her work has been featured by PBS, NPR, New York Times, The Guardian, and the Academy of American Poets Poem a Day series, and has also appeared in periodicals such as Poetry, uh, Kenyan Review, Psychology Today, New Ohio Review, Harvard Review, Missouri Review, and New England Review, and so much more. Her awards include the Penn Review Poetry Prize, congratulations with everything, the Tom Howard Prize from Winning Writers, Jendi Writer on the show, uh, is a friend of Assiduous <laughs> Dust, and the Lucille Medwick, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, mm -hmm. Medwick, uh, Memorial Award from the Poetry Society of America, and more. So much more. There's so much more. I am so glad and honored, grateful, groovy to have you on the show. Uh, Melissa, I like to start off by saying, is there something, let's say, that you have in the works, or maybe something that you've, not, you've never thought of? Could be a silly thing with regard to ways to write a poem or aspects of things that you have planned or not planned, but is just silly as, as hell for writing a poem. Uh, previous people have said, I've never skydived, uh, uh, done skydiving in, while writing a poem, or that they're actually doing writing a poem while um, sitting on the, on the toilet. Uh, for like a, a a thing of like toilet world toilet poetry day. Um, so is there something in a similar vein or completely different that you have uh, or I something have or have not done that you that you have not done okay. and are looking forward to the silly version and then maybe also the um, the uh, more uh, the not as silly version. <laughs> okay. Um, so something silly that I would like to do while, um, I, I mean, I have never written a poem while at a parade. <laughs> I think that would be fun. Like a parade or a march yeah. uh, or something oh, like that. That would Just, be so cool. Oh yeah. my. And kind of like documenting everything, you know? Yeah. Well, also I, I feel that I write better when there's a bit of chaos around me because um, I can get easily distracted. But if like music while I write or something like that, then it just cancels out all of everything mm -hmm. else and I focus on what I'm doing. Yeah. So I think it, like being at a parade or, you know, some, I don't know, political rally, just something where there's total chaos around me would be a really fun way to write a poem. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and that's great. And, and uh, you know, I find that, um, you know, it, it's interesting that you pointed out um, is that about chaos and things canceling out. You know, I have a mathematics background and though, uh, you know, of course, you know, a negative and a negative uh, is, a, is a positive for <laughs> multiplying. <laughs> but there's something about that that I find that's interesting that you can utilize um, the chaos, not just also of the past, as well as what's going on currently mm -hmm. um, in this pandemic world in which we live in, um, or just whatever, with regard to um, creativity and mm -hmm. a means to kind of be of service. And mm -hmm. I know you've been of service in 
so many different ways as well as through your um your your uh your program of, of vita mm -hmm. as well and i wonder if you could kind of you know share a bit about that you know take us to you know who you know describe paint us a picture of who melissa stuttered was um upon creation of that or at different points as well as um now currently and how you're utilizing the the pandemic and all this to to cancel out the the chaos um i know that's a big question so we'll just we'll chunk away and we'll see where it goes okay sure well i think um there were a few questions embedded in there and i also feel like I'm, <laughs> I, I'm, my apologies I, oh no 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 i think i might be able to hold the threads but i do want to backtrack and say i never i told you my silly that i would be in a oh um, that's right what you're serious but my serious one is um since the pandemic has started i've started a garden um like a really serious garden i've i'm growing mm. two kinds of kale and I've got broccoli and cauliflower, peppers, all kinds of herbs. I mean, mm. a, a romaine, lettuce, everything. And I, for some reason, I, I have actually never gone out and sat in my own garden to write. And it just occurs to me now that we're talking. Thank That's you. so surprising. Of it. Yeah. Wow. Well, I haven't had it that long. I mean, yeah. it's not like I've been gardening my whole life. It's just been since the pandemic began and um, it just never really occurred to me. But now I think I want to just go put a blanket out on the lawn and, and sit in my own garden and write. So <laughs> thank you for making me think of that. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, uh, you could even I know that, uh, you know, a previous guest, Thelma uh, T. Uh, uh, Reyna, um, that she has uh, this beautiful garden that I've been able to be part of, that she has all these things that she's even done in the past poetry readings from there, but obviously not oh, now. Oh my but gosh. Yeah. What a lovely idea. That's yeah. nice. Okay, so to go to your other question. Right. Um, <laughs> um, so I think you wanted me to talk a little bit about when I was doing podcasting and then sort of talk about some things related to the yeah. pandemic. Yeah, and, and paint us a picture. Let's yeah. try this thing about uh, share us your garden of your past. You know, <laughs> let's 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 try to mix metaphors, find the theme. <laughs> OK, OK, I've got it. So um, regarding the podcasts, I actually started originally with a uh, um, a magazine called To Ferret, which is a journal of spiritual literature. I'm familiar yeah. with it. Great. Yeah. 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 So I, I did a, a podcast series for them and I interviewed all kinds of people, but mainly people whose um, work in some way had a, a spiritual bent, whether it was a poet or um, a nonfiction writer, whomever it was, it was just, you know, there was some sort of spirituality there. And that was a, a really interesting and enlightening time for me because I learned a lot. Um, I mean, think about if you were reading these mm -hmm. books that were helping you sort of develop and evolve as a, a person. And then yeah. you got the opportunity to talk to the people who wrote those books and ask them any question you want. I mean, I guess that's what you do now. <laughs> I don't know. Absolutely. To it. Yeah, no, but, no. And you kind yeah. of learn and grow from it and reflect and you're like, oh, there I was then. Exactly, exactly. And you just think like, oh, uh, I mean, I can sort of trace. Well, after I had this person on my show, then I became better at this, or I learned to be kinder to myself, or I learned how to That's a biggie. make a son hit, or, you know, sometimes it was something technical, sometimes it was something, you know, that was more, uh, yeah, like development of the self. And then, um, so I did that for quite a while. And then from there, I shifted over to working for Vita, which is a women's um, literary arts the activist and social justice organization that originally started with the idea of making sure that there was equal representation for women as well as men in um, like bylines of magazines and journals and that kind of thing. And then it start, started to expand out to where it, um, you know, wanted to take into account not just women, but all genders and also um, people who have uh, any kind of disability or, right. um, you know, it took into account race, um, it took into account 
um, you know, sexual orientation, anything that could be used to malign or sideline someone so that they weren't getting the attention that they deserved with their work. Absolutely. And that, and that's so important. You know, I, I found that, um, you know, particularly because especially giving that voice and having that platform allows other individuals to be like, Hey, um, Whoa, I, I heard this. I didn't realize I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one going through this. And as well as to bring the next generation of individuals to share and perhaps uh, to create uplift and advocacy. I find that that's terrific. As myself, as um, someone with autism, I say with autism instead of autistic. That's my right. preference. Okay. Um, I, as well as a recovering um, you know, uh, drug addict and alcoholic. Um, that I find that, you know, I looked at it and it's like, there's not a literary journal specifically for that combo. What's going on here? You want more representation. And also, if you look at it uh, historically, you can find, for example, there are different individuals in the uh, beats. You know, we had uh, Diane uh, De Prima, mm -hmm. uh, who who passed, and then we had Ruth Weiss. Um, and Diane De Prima, for example, is someone that you know, you might not be as aware of as part of the, the beats unless you do as opposed to, uh, you know, Jack Kerouac or Allen Ginsberg. Uh, right. But it's somewhat someone who's as as much, if not equally important to mm. that and making sure such individuals are, are represented. That's right. That's exactly right. <laughs> it's such important work because I, I feel that, um, you know, if we don't, as humans, have um, the opportunity to hear from the people who have a wide array of experiences, then we really can't have a full understanding of what it means to be human. And it breaks down our empathy. I mean, if we want to have empathy, we can't just read uh, you know, one little subsection of humanity and let that be representative of, of right. the experience. We need to... That won't help us also to yeah. not repeat history right. as well. Right, right. Yeah, because like poet, there's, a, I think that as, as well, there's a fine connection to poetry and uh, history. Mm -hmm. um, there's this, you know, you find different things going on. Um, and I wonder, you know, let's, let's talk a bit about your, your history. Um, mm -hmm. or her street, whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I've heard different things, not to poke fun at, at, at different things. I, I find, you know, it, it's interesting how words um, have such an impact. You could just mm -hmm. find out so much by looking at the, studying the words, looking at how somebody selects their, their words. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the words that exist and don't exist, you know, like the, there's the word avuncular, which means uncle-like, but there's no yeah. down part, you know? Yeah. What does that tell you about us? <laughs> Absolutely. And there are, you know, uh, there are just so many words also of creating words. It's like, what do I want to do with poetry? And mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, let's, let's, you look, let's look at, um, you know, Melissa, you, let's rewind, you before, <laughs> before there are like no sound, sound effects. effects, yeah, before, um, let's just say, before, um, before you got into the whole uh, literary scene, mm -hmm. you know, who, did you fathom that you would be doing what you're doing today, and let's just paint a picture of little steps that you took to get you where you're going, I know that's a big huge thing, but mm. let's look at your garden of the past mm -hmm. and, you know, paint a picture for us as though we're sharing a story if possible. And we'll focus on a few things and kind of look like so that we can help the next generation. So we can help other individuals who've um, overcome certain obstacles. Okay, sure. Where would you like me to begin? <laughs> I uh. mean, I remember picking the, the little popcorn mm -hmm. piece paint off the wall in the crib when I was a baby. Maybe that's too far back. <laughs> that's too far back. Let's, let's focus maybe, you know, let's say 15, 20 years uh, okay. from that. Yeah. Okay. So um, when I was a teenager, actually, 
I, I don't think that I ever really considered the idea that I could be a writer because um, the sort of world that I grew up in, it was very suburban, uh, very practical. The people around me were you know, lawyers and doctors and those kinds of people. And you didn't just go off and become yeah, an artist. My father's a lawyer. So, you know, he, you know. Yes. Yes. Like, so you get it. And so I, um, I loved to read. I, I read just so much that it, it, people were shocked. I mean, I would, when I was a teenager, I would like read War and Peace over spring break or something uh, like that. People would be uh, teasing me. Oh, a little. An addiction of reading. <laughs> What's that? A reading addict? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So I loved reading, but I, I never considered the possibility of being a writer. And further, the, the things that we read in school were all, uh, you know, like Shakespeare and Chaucer and like people who've yeah. been for hundreds of years. Yeah. And I just didn't realize that people still wrote literary stuff. I knew that there were like bestseller type pop or like novelists uh, or, you know, or the self help book. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Oh, no, no, I, I need those. <laughs> yeah. But what I mean, though, is that I didn't realize that a person could become a poet or a short story writer or something like that. I thought you had to be like, you know, a best selling novelist, which seemed so far out of reach, you, you didn't even strive for it. Or, you know, you were just someone who'd been dead for 400 years. So what happened was I ended up doing my bachelor's degree at the University of mm -hmm. Houston. And the University of Houston has one of the top writing programs in the country. So I was constantly surrounded by writers and I would be, you know, standing outside of class waiting for the, the door to open or whatever and start talking to people in the hall and starting to realize that these people actually were writers. <laughs> they were. Yeah. You know, and, and when that set right in, it's something like, whoa, you know. Like, I didn't realize in, you know, and it's cool also when professors are, or even in high school, for example, I had a teacher who was, you know, a judge for the, the uh, you know, for time for the, uh, the Caden Kingsley Tufts, um, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you know, the big hundred yeah, thousand dollar prize for yeah. held at Claremont Graduate University. And also, you know, doing stuff with finishing line press and all that stuff. But I had no clue. But I remember the teacher said, hey, you know, I do some poetry and stuff. So later when I wanted to get into this, I asked that person uh, what to do. And it's great when people are also say, hey, you know, this is what I'm doing. And it provide opportunities and inspiration. Right, right. So, I mean, that was it for me. Just the 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 realization that it was actually a possibility or something I could do. And I, I actually misspoke a little bit because mm -hmm. when I discovered that was actually in grad school because I got a BA in lit from the University of Houston and then I started in on an MA in lit at the University of Houston. Mm -hmm. I was meeting these other grad students who were creative writing students and I said, ah, I want to do over. I want creative writing. So I ended up leaving. I finished the MA and then I went to Sarah Lawrence in New York and got an MFA there. And, um, and it, I mean, it's been a, a, a path of fits and starts too. Because Absolutely. I, I went and got my MFA. I wrote while I was there. And then um, I was I had gone there with the, the person who I was married to at the time. He was working on a PhD at NYU. I was doing the MFA at Sarah Lawrence. And um, I became pregnant with my daughter while I was there. And so maybe, and then we, sadly we were divorced uh, not that long after that. So um, I found myself suddenly a single mom with a full-time job and <laughs> all this stuff. And I didn't write for years and years. Mm. And, and my what did it feel like when you then finally wrote? Like, did it feel like, whoa, did it feel like, like the walls were becoming, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, maybe not that, but. I, don't think I wasn't crazy anymore because honestly, hmm. I think that if you're a writer, your brain will try to write even when you're not writing. <laughs> and so. I can so oh, relate. Yeah. And if you are writing, then you're doing something. It makes sense. It's not you know, it's not like your mind is running away from you, but if you're trying to not write and your mind is constantly making up dialogue and doing I mean, all these things, you're like, what's going at on? All. <laughs> yeah, I, I say like, I, you know, I write to kind of clean my bowl, you know, of the mind, mm -hmm. so to speak. It's like, you know, I'll be at like dinner, let's say for 
um, you know, a few weeks ago, uh, I was at for Thanksgiving dinner and it's like, you know, mom, dad, I'm, I'm sorry, but, uh, I need to have some, a paper and some pen over here. I'll put it on the other chair because, uh, my mind's kind of talking to me every now and then. So I need to write something so that I can be able to be present for the conversation. You know, that's, that's a really lovely way of putting it. My mind's talking to me. You know, your mind knows it wants and to not write. in a way of being crazy, but you know, I think, you know, there's a difference between being insane and, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and crazy. And I think for me, it's like, at least I like to say, I've heard this one. I'm not sure if you have that. Uh, those who are insane don't realize they are um, <laughs> insane or don't realize they're crazy. So I, I can differ. I can oscillate between the two. That, that's good. I like that. And, um, you know, I do, I mean, I do think writers are mostly a little crazy. I mean, by the standards, if it, it depends on what the point of comparison is and who's making the judgment. But I would think that a lot of people who are not writers would find writers a little crazy. But I, I think that's also why people are fascinated with writers. They wish they could just sort of be freer <laughs> like writers. Yeah. Are. And, and that's and that's the point, as well as being able to be free during in the midst of chaos and allow that freedom and chaos to ground one, mm -hmm. kind of, which kind of goes back to what you were saying about how, for example, of in the middle of a parade or Mardi Gras or something to be able to write or whatnot, that it's grounding or having white noise or something in the background. And that that's that's something that's I find is somewhat in, intrinsic also. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe it's not intrinsic, but it, it's different, but to the poet or the writer. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what's your, your, you know, I'm also curious, what's your, uh, was there a certain point that you realized this is what works for me that I need? Sometimes I do better in chaos, like, and particularly, you know, what's your, uh, what do you do? Do you, do you take, um, you know, how, you know, some individuals who are artists, they'll take a canvas and they'll start stabbing it. Um, <laughs> you know, what's your, your, your stabbing canvas? equivalent and, and when did you did you find out one of your 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 stabbing equivalents uh, that's, that's, that sounds that. very but yeah yeah no no I really I really love it and I've never heard it put quite that way because I you know I was at a writing residency um a couple of years ago and it, it was a really neat residency it was actually an artist's retreat so there were composers there painters novelists poets it wasn't just writers so a lot of people from these different artistic disciplines were in conversation frequently which was that that kind of talk was very helpful to to practice and that kind of thing. But um, one of the things that came up was the, the people who were not writers would sort of ask the writers, um, now, do you find that as writers, you tend to <laughs> sabotage certain things in your life unintentionally, subconsciously to cause Guilty. a little suffering? <laughs> to cause a little suffering so you can fill enough angst to write? Because I was like, why do you, composers and painters do that too and they're like no we just notice you writers doing it <laughs> <laughs> oh wow that is that is that's but um bum right and i said how wonderfully observant is that so i would say yes occasionally i i do tend to subconsciously cause a bit of trouble in my life i mean right before i spoke to you i i broke a lamp in this room which caused me to have to panic and run around and get everything cleaned up right before we talked and i would say that was just a fluke, but I had that happen before another um, <laughs> reading and interview recently, uh -oh. and I'm like, okay, okay, I need. Have to, you I read the poem that. about about that? Because that would be great, or there might be just a line that it inspires that particular thing <laughs> of like the the lamp the lamp shatter <laughs> or something. I don't oh, know. The so lamp light. Like, else though that's not that's a little more constructive as chaos um let me i'm going to step away for a minute and grab okay. this to show. while you're um, grabbing it what is your favorite color my favorite poet yeah your favorite color oh my favorite color it's okay. a really hard question 
No, it's not hard at all. It's just that <laughs> I have multiple, multiple answers. My favorite color to wear is black. My favorite color to decorate with is blue. Um, my favorite color for nature is like the sort of sunset colors. <laughs> so, I mean, I can't zero in on one color. It has to do with what, you know, what the situation is. <laughs> Yeah, that's interesting. So, My favorite color is red, but because I chose it a long time ago, though I don't always like wearing or seeing or something red, but I just say it that it's red. That's so interesting. You know, I had a student <laughs> time, I asked them what their favorite color was, and she said that her favorite color was orange, but she didn't want people to know, so she always told people it was yellow. And I just thought, now that's an interesting person. I I don't know hmm. why she feels that way, but I have to learn about this. <laughs> yeah, it, it'll be a person's uh, thesis one day. So tell us. Yeah, let's what, do this. Though. Would you be willing to change your favorite color? You know, at some point. Okay, willing doesn't mean that I that I have to. No, no, it just means that it's a possibility. <laughs> I, I think I might, depending how much money somebody like paid me to like <laughs> change it. I don't know. Uh, I don't think I asked the question right. Okay, so here's the real question. If you started to notice that some and be other, aware of if you started to become aware that say yellow is now your favorite color, would you be willing to make that transition or would you need to keep saying it was red? Mm. I think I'd need to say it's it's red because, for example, I'm a I'll say jokingly that I'm oh that I'm I'll say I'm a serial killer in the sense that I don't like cereal because I had it once and I didn't like it. And mm. I think that I said that so that way I would never um, so I could say that in an awkward situation. So therefore, I can't have cereal. I got it. Yeah. I get that. Okay. <laughs> What's in here? Yes. So I have these all over my office, probably 20 of them. <laughs> these are boxes and they've got all kinds of things in them. This one says doing. So oh, wow. it has, let's see. Sparked. <laughs> it's got verbs in it. So this oh, one. My, oh, wait, so you have your box of that yeah. is so will you just pick them out every now and then and like yeah uh, or you'll just like every uh, you'll be like oh this is one I want to put in there I learned a new word or so abstract yeah these are abstract words right here <laughs> yeah so that's what I do I mean things mm -hmm. these are nouns um that are not abstract so yeah when i hear words that just interest me or that i like or when i'm reading or anything i put them in my box and then this is how it relates to chaos yeah. i just uh pull some out or dump them out on my desk and tell myself i have to put them in a poem <laughs> oh wow and, yeah do you, do you have a poem uh that you uh, particularly use this this method or one of the first times you use this method uh, this method you know, or an early time you use this method that you that you'd be willing to uh, to take out of the box uh, and and share with us um, I don't have one from an early time but I have one from yesterday because Ooh. I write home every day it's really weird though I have to yeah. warn you I haven't revised or edited it at all yet i just put in the words <laughs> okay oh wait no i can't read it it it, it might be a little racy <laughs> i just realized okay yeah, yeah yeah let me think if i have one that's not racy okay um, okay. okay i have one i have one I can well it up. depends what, what 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 do you mean by uh racy but i uh, but like a little sexually racy uh i think that should be fine. I, I'm not sure. It, it depends. But but if there's another that you particularly would prefer, by all means. Um, here's one that I wrote recently using words from the box that is, again, also not done. I just wrote it two days ago. I've been writing a poem every day. 
So of this course. one also relates to the pandemic. And it's called For the One Who Holds Me When I Cannot Be Held. At night, I wear my history around my neck, come to you like a daffodil, kneeling to the season's first snow. I sew worries together inside my other mind and call it sleep, but I don't sleep anymore. The proverb, proverb says, drink in the morning and the whole day is free. So I drink angst through a straw until evening, like a fish drinking the remnants of sunset through the fingertips of new moon. And so the sea is, and the gall of night, coming over and again to shore, as if nothing had changed, but everything has changed. How long since I hugged my mother or father? We look like a family, but we are a holding pattern, a swirl of hope, circling a quarantine, waiting permission to land. Ooh. So we do something here. We do snap, 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 clap, clap, clap. Thank round you. Round of applause. You, you got to do a round of applause. Yeah. So I, I thank you for sharing that. And I, I look forward to seeing how it looks. And, and yeah. now you'll be doing round of applause with, all the time. It's just, you know, what, love- when people say round of applause, it's like, why wouldn't you just? So yeah. I, I really love that. Uh, and there's also a line of, of you know, a swirl of, what was it? A swirl of awe. Oh, so the holding patterns and it, and just there's also something spiritual about that mm-hmm. that we are this we are also held and sometimes we're put in a box and we're saved and we don't know when it needs to emerge just like with mm-hmm. um for example the words of which right. and it emerges and we're swirling we have these emotions that come up mm-hmm. um and also how can we see the patterns in that and allow that to grow from kind of our garden, our history, our way to be of service? I don't know. I'm just mixing so many metaphors. It makes sense. No, no, I, I think you're really on to something, though, because I think, um, you know, the idea is, um, you know, that, yes, we can find that inspiration will come to us and these, you know, things will come to us, but we also have to sort of put ourselves in the way of them. And Mm -hmm. so by collecting words, and I don't just collect words, I've got images, phrases, lists, all kinds, prompts, all kinds of things, weird facts. And um, by collecting these things, though, I'm putting myself in the way of inspiration. And then after that, it's just like rolling dice or something. I can trust. Yeah, And you see when it, Exactly. Right. Like by it putting out. things in place near you so that, you know, you're kind of inspired as you go along. So it becomes part of your day, especially if you're writing a poem a day. Um, well, you know, interestingly, I it, to, to take it more to the spiritual level that, that you were taking it to, I listened to a podcast with Jane Goodall recently, and she actually has some very interesting things to say about the pandemic. But one of the things that was not necessarily pandemic related was that she has a box like this, which I thought was so funny because I've never heard of anyone other than ah. me. But she has a, a box full of like, I think it might be either quotes or Bible passages or something. And whenever anyone in the family is having trouble, they go and just pull a random one out of the box. And that is it, it you know they trust what it says to speak to what they need to hear at that moment and it's sort of a similar kind of thing with the words yeah. and, and images and things that interesting. i have interesting yeah i feel like now you gotta have a box called box of jane which is specifically <laughs> those from uh of, of her works and have that of uh and have the jane goodall box i love that and i but it doesn't I could just have a box of Jane. It doesn't have to be all Jane good all because my grandmother's name was Jane. My aunt's middle name is Jane. My middle name is Jane. My daughter's middle name is Jane. And my niece's middle name is Jane. So Uh, my middle name is Jane. (gasps) I know it's not. It's not. It's not. I just wanted to see your face. It's Michael. But I'm sorry. I just I'm sorry. I had to do that. I I had to do that. Um, Worth it for the moment. So so tell us. So when did you particularly find yourself, you know, how did you get, there must be a story behind this box, this, this, uh, your box, your box of, uh, uh, abstract. Uh, huh. 
Like, um, it, it, there must be a day, like, it didn't all of a sudden be there. It must have been over time. There must have been oh, a period that, there was, yeah. You're right. So what happened was I started noticing that I, it's not just words. It's words, phrases, lines, quotes, entire poems. I was coming across these things, and I liked them, and I wanted to sort of retain them. Um, and just, you know, you can underline and circle things in a book, but, you know, you have to remember to go back to that specific book and blah, blah, blah. And I, I started thinking, you know, I want these things around me for inspiration. So I started just keeping a notebook. And then from the notebook, I was like, no, I don't want to be flipping through a notebook. I want to just randomly pull them out and not always start at the same beginning. So then I started putting them on little scraps of paper. And then I was throwing those little scraps of paper in a basket. And one of the baskets was a, a big basket of words. Mm. And then one day I thought, I should organize my words. <laughs> and then it turned into <laughs> baskets for the words. And uh, it just sort of grew from there. Yeah, your garden of words grew. Mm -hmm. It did. Yeah, that'd be a, a, a good thing, uh, a title. For something and now you, you get to do is uh, use that and maybe you could even have little baskets of things in the garden as well and place in different places. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I have lots of interesting things like that in the garden but I do like that to, if I could find yeah. something that was sort yeah. of and wet. if you bury the word say, if you yeah. bury the word and if you, you give it just yeah. enough sunlight and just enough you know water or I don't know, or chai iced tea, depending. I'm not sure. It might it might flourish to be something. I don't know. I think that's a very good idea. And I think that if I had something like sort of weatherproof that had words in it that I could just sort of pull out in the garden. And I mean, because for me, it's really about the um, it, it's about the, the the texture of two things crossing that weren't intentionally put together. So if I just put two words together in a very intentional way, then I might get something that's um, beautiful or deep. But to add to, for me, that extra layer of it being interesting, there has to be something a little random or haphazard mm -hmm. in it. So um, by mixing up the words like that, um, you know, I can do it. And then I put it back in order when I create the poem. You know? Absolutely. And that's the thing of like injecting chaos into something. For example, if you have something that's too pristine um, and similarly, there, you know, life is messy. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's an order to things when you look back mm -hmm. and you see, uh, for example, of your own history, your own garden of your own story. And then you can see how, how this happened in certain ways. And in fact, you met a certain person, then you met this person. Certain things kind of overlap and it tells a natural story. Um, but at the time, and, it, and I guess the trick is to be able to utilize those things in our, in our lives mm -hmm. so we can enjoy our planting this garden right. of, of our, not just our words, but also our, of ourselves. Right, right. And going back to what you said a minute ago, I, the reason I like the idea of having the words in the garden is because it does create that texture of, of, you know, I don't think that my words and my garden will go together. I think that my office and my garden will go together or the baskets and, I mean, I mean my office and the words or the baskets and the words, but the right. words in the garden suddenly adds something a little strange that uh, makes yeah. the brain sort of wire differently. And then yeah, look for those connections or something, yeah. or perhaps stumble upon them, you know, <laughs> accidentally or incidentally, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, and the brain will do what the brain will do with something too. You know, I, it's one of the things that I love about teaching is I can give my students an assignment and I, I can just say something like, write about an, an apple, uh, you know, a ruler and a semicolon or whatever. And if I tell them, that, but the main story is about the apple, it's like one person who loves organic groceries and whatever will write about going to the organic market and buying an organic apple. And then someone who 
has problems with their stepmother will write some Snow White kind of thing with the apple. And then, you know, it, it's like the apple is going to take, somebody else might write about the big apple and going to New York. It's just your mind. Yeah, you think that's the subject, but really it shows you the real subject. Exactly. And that sort of indirection uh, is what helps you be able to write about the subject in an interesting way. Because sometimes I feel that people might try to be too direct. Um, I'm thinking mostly of like beginning creative writing students who come in and they just, they've been, you know, like I was at the beginning, you know, you've been bottled up all these years and you finally know that you can be a writer and you want to just say what you want to say, like it just spit it out exactly how you want to say it. And, you know, to learn that if you come at it from the side door instead of the front door, uh, you know, sometimes you can really get a lot more accomplished that way. Mm -hmm. And it will allow you to see the, the the workings of your own mind, too, which to me is a lot of what poetry is about. I want to, I read other people's poems because I like to see the rhythms of their thoughts and the way their mind works. Um, it's just right there on the page for you, you know. And I love that. Absolutely. And I want to um, share that there, there's a, um, you know, I know that you've won quite a, a, a lot of awards, particularly uh, that's, um, and, you know, also congratulate on you on the, uh, the award for the, the Penn Poetry Prize. Um, and, and, you know, I'm curious also if you would share that, um, the, the piece, of course, I'm sure everybody's asking you to read that one of, of uh, you know, uh, you know, the bit, uh, about the the pain is uh, so resplendent. It has babies, and and uh, but I wonder if you could also share what um, particularly was there an indirection or something that kind of led to that, or was there an inspiration for that? Um, what was going on in your life, or was it looking at multiple different parts? Were no. some aspects from the box? Actually, no. This one was. This is very interesting how this poem got created. So um, first, the first thing is I I dance a lot when I write. Um, and I've been taking, I always wanted to dance um, and, and I didn't when I was younger and only in later years have I started taking dance lessons and somehow the, the dancing and the writing have become really intertwined for me. So um, that's the first thing to know. The second thing to know is that um, a few months before this poem was written, I had been in a very serious car accident and broken some ribs. And um, I was in a tremendous amount of physical pain. And um, I was just like, oh, you know, it, it's like the pain is just making more pain and there keeps being more pain. And, I just couldn't even make sense of it. And um, so mm. I was thinking about that, but then somehow the that, resplendent part that, and that, that right now that, that comes in, in two ways. One is that of course, because we're poets, we're not going to think about physical pain without also thinking about psychological and emotional pain. And so all of that started working its way into my thoughts about this, but then I, hadn't been able to dance for a long time and I had just started being able to dance and I was so in love with dancing. And um, finally, I, I started feeling a little better and I put on some flamenco music, which you know that, is- That makes sense also of circling and everything and just yeah. dancing. It makes sense also with the rhythm of the piece and the selection yeah. of words as though you're, you, you might have even been circling or dancing while you're doing it. Or, or, or I can I or mm. I can actually see that now in the selection of the words. Um, yeah. So, oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, no. I was uh, I was done with that. Oh no, that's exactly what happened. Though I finally got to where I felt well enough to dance again, and I put on this flamenco music, and I was kind of dancing around, and I started feeling some little pangs of pain, but it wasn't so bad that I had to stop the way it had been before. And I was finally feeling better enough to, to dance a little bit, but also, you know, flamenco is full of duende and, you know, passion and, you know, and, and that's where the resplendent uh, comes in because I was thinking about that. I was thinking about like Lorca and that gorgeous kind of, you mm. know, lack of fear of looking at something that is painful and, 
you know, um, just sort of allowing oneself to go to to these luminous places that aren't necessarily always comfortable. And then hearkening back to what you and I spoke about earlier with uh, poets sometimes and novelists and whatever, uh, causing their own suffering so that they have mm. nothing to write about. Those thoughts <laughs> in and so I but you're right I, I basically wrote this poem while I was dancing because I was dancing and this poem started coming to me and uh, I just sat down and wrote it down I wrote the whole poem and um, you know less than a, a half an hour maybe 15 20 minutes and I don't I don't think I ever even revised it to be honest and I, I don't want to give the impression that that's how it always is for me I have poems right that no it's a it's, time to write. It's yeah. particular to the piece itself. Right, right. It, it just pushed its way out of me. And then that was another thing. It gave, uh, hence it gave birth. It has babies. That's and that, where the babies and so that came. actually, so <laughs> what was going on internally ended up influencing the context, which is something that I think is so important to utilize that you're using your whole medium and then the poem becomes therapy. That's exactly right. So would you share? Uh, yes, uh, I would love to. With us? This is actually my first time, I think, to, to share this poem aloud. So thank you for asking Ooh. me. Yeah. So it's called, The Pain is So Resplendent It Has Babies. The pain is so resplendent it has babies. And its babies are so resplendent they have babies. Underage, unwed babies having babies. Someone has built their delivery room in my ribs, and without restraint, they come and go, carrying babies that will birth more babies in the parking lot before realizing they are babies, flamboyant babies, refusing the swaddle of pink and blue. They leave the hospital in sequined evening gowns to perform the burlesque of pain, and everyone in the audience has their shirts unbuttoned to nurse the babies they carry everywhere. And the speakers, instead of making sound, make babies. And the curtains open and close on a pulley of pain operated by the babies. And when the magician comes on, she saws the pain in half, and there are two more pains that saw themselves in half. And now the pain knows how to saw itself in half to make more pain. And there are pain babies everywhere, and there are no rabbits or doves in the hat, just more babies. And when the cocktail waitress comes around, she serves little cups of pain, shots of pain with pain backs on the rocks and pain crudités on leafy green beds of pain. And when I try to leave the show to go home, the MC announces that I'm up next. And I realize it was just me on stage all along, having babies and babies and more babies with no epidurals. I realize it is me who has conceived and mothered and nurtured my pain all along. Snap, 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 clap, Thank clap, you. clap. Round of applause. Thank you. Yes. I'm not it, myself. I'm just so excited that you're doing it. Doing yeah, it. <laughs> I know. I know. You'll, you'll have to credit me for the, the clap of the round of applause thing. I like um, it. It, that's just such an incredible piece. And thank you for sharing that with me and with us. Um, I, I really find that it speaks so much. And, um, you know, I can see that of the curtains um, uh, being revealed and then you know, how do you want to uh, grow from the pain? How do you want to, yep. Are we going to make a poem together? Yes, we, ah, you took, so oh, I wonder, would you grow with me at, and let's gather ourselves and put ourselves in the garden of words and the garden of stars and grow that resplendent pain and have momentous moment babies that exist born of flamingo flying birds and sea eagles and dancing on the erratic, erratic auras of OTSCP on the spot collaborative poem. Yay. Okay. So. Would you like to do that? 
I and I like to. for me, I like to also share the show the book. You don't have to do that, but uh what, what? I don't trust myself to not drop the computer. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well then don't do that. Um okay. I've had practice doing this. Uh so I'm thrilled to do this. Would you like to share with us the uh the names uh of the uh books that you have out and the titles and then the page numbers, please. Sure. So I have as my first book, 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. And I have it open to pages 98 and 99. And I have An Alchemy of Mind by Diane Ackerman. And I have that open to pages 232 and 233. I have as well Derrida and Indian Philosophy by Harold Coward, and that's open to pages eight and nine. And my final book is Edge of Taos Desert by Mabel Dodge Lujan. Ooh, nice. I'll have to check out some of those. I have out um, Ellen Maybe, The Cowardice of Amnesia. Um, and Ellen's been on the, the show as a friend of the show. Um, and I have it out to pages 54 and 55, which is page, the seventh page, seventh and eighth page of her long poem, Fido. Um, I have out the, um, the beat book, um, edited by Anne Waldman. And I have it out to a section by Diane De Prima. Uh, the late Diane de Prima, so pages 124 and 125, which has the practice of magical evocation, which is something we're about to do, and <laughs> Monte, Montezuma, and then the beginning of For the Dead Lecture. And then I have, next to that, I have The Poetry of Strangers, which is a recent title by uh, Brian Sonia Wallace, which is also uh, uh, a friend of Assiduous Dust, who's been on an episode so pages 168 and 169 and then to spice things up and add a little philosophical regurgitation i have uh nausea uh, uh <laughs> yeah yeah by, sorry, um uh, pages 132 and 133 um okie dokie would you like to uh start us off um, I can try, but if I don't do it right, you stop me and start okay. back up and then we'll... Okay, or would you like me to start and we, we go back and forth that way? I, I can start. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, let me see here. Ursula understood exaggeration, exaggerations armed with... Uh, the short work of the males uh, and worst of all, a reclusive and escaped cigar. <laughs> Blah, prove again, blah. No city is believing ourselves. Suddenly uncertain light stirring summer. Their own poems add books through Bill's uncertain skulls. On one occasion, a wooden ballot box, guided by smell, stressed by landscapes, in the spell of ignorance, arguing against Kant, surrounded the Rio Grande. Existence came from the wood house with screenplays under 
split blazing academia under they with the dead something, the dead blah, 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 the dead nothingness, those reborn eyes, legends, deep. We're Freemasons, liberal candidates, pursuing mates, wasting time and time and momentary powerful openings of lava. <laughs> Wind voracious devouring music clotted after the lecturer speak versationalists anymore blah i have isolated transparent thought i affect ductile will subtle but irrevocable. Don Apollinar. Grouped the different writings across the rocks in this country. Suddenly, empty hands, young shell job, before the great something existing in effort. That opinion which sympathized with the cerebral hemispheres evolved into opposite view in the form of a yellow dream nothing repugnant explosions Breath prompted. Heightened streams and stimulus. A village called solitary. Oh, I like that ending. That's a nice <laughs> ending. I think a that's village, the end. A village called solitary. I uh, think at the end, I kind of got the hang of how to do this. <laughs> yes. Th well, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yes. And it was a pleasure. I'm, you know, I, people have said, and, you know, the OTSCP, you know, segment, eh, you don't need the interview. That's the most fun part. And, <laughs> yeah, but you need to, to work your way to it. I want to say thank you so much. And I will type that up and share that with you. And you can share and maybe even be for if you'd like to be included in the Assiduous Dust Anthology. And so I, 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 I wonder, first off, do you have any idea for names for that? What would you title this? Hmm. Hmm. I would title it The Outcome of Such. The Outcome of Such. Yes. I actually like that. <laughs> it's the outcome of such. I don't know why I'm doing this, but I like doing <laughs> I don't know, but I'm doing it too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, Melissa, thank you so much. Are there any um, final last words, links, shout outs you'd like to um, offer? Yeah, actually. Um, I, first of all, I want to say thank you to you for having me here. It's been such a 
delightful conversation and uh, I'm just so happy to have spent this time with you. And, uh, yeah. And uh, I think just to other people, I would like to say I know that this is actually a really hard time right now. And um, I'm just wishing everybody the best on having the strength and resolve to just sort of get through everything and find what they need within themselves to um, persevere and uh, find meaning and peace and hope and joy um, until things get a little better. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And um, any links, uh, particularly any places that you, you'd recommend, uh, favorite bookstore perhaps, uh, place for where people can get your, your stuff or would particularly that you'd like your website? Uh, yeah, I mean, my yeah. website is just my name, melissastuttered.com. Uh, yeah. um, I would definitely encourage people to seek out independent bookstores and independent all kinds of stores right now because, uh, you know, they're struggling and that's a way to, to help them out. So if you buy my book, try to buy it from you know your local bookseller or someone else who will be very delighted to make the sale. <laughs> Terrific. Well, I hope uh, that listeners or viewers, however you're witnessing this, um, go do that. Makes for a great gift. Maybe you forgot to give someone a gift and now you're like, oh, here's for new year, a book that will change everything. So nice. don't the advice of your work that way. Thank you so much, um, you. Melissa. And uh, it's a wrap. Yeah. yeah.